Good morning to you. It is Saturday, October the 10th. I'm Ali Velshi. We begin with a courageous and determined Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer back on the campaign trail yesterday, stumping for a Democratic state representative in Traverse City, Michigan, just a day after facing down a foiled domestic terror plot to kidnap or even kill her. On Thursday, federal and state authorities announced the arrests of 13 men on a host of charges connected to alleged plots to kidnap Whitmer and attack state government buildings and officials. In a Washington Post op-ed, Whitmer clearly laid part of the blame at the feet of the president, writing, quote, When our leaders encourage domestic terrorists, they legitimize their actions. When they stoke and contribute to hate speech, they are complicit. And when a sitting president stands on a national stage refusing to condemn white supremacists and hate groups, as President Trump did when he told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by during the first presidential debate, he is complicit. Hate groups heard the president's words not as a rebu rebuke, but as a rallying cry, as a call to action, end quote. For his part, the president's response to a thwarted plot against an American governor was to complain that she didn't thank him. Quote, rather than say thank you, she calls me a white supremacist. We're witnessing the unraveling of an American president before our very eyes just 24 days before what has been called the most consequential election of our lifetimes. Last night, the second presidential debate in Miami was officially canceled after Trump refused to participate virtually less than a week after he was released from the hospital with an infectious disease that has killed 215,000 Americans. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis, the destabilizing effect it's having on our government is unconscionable. He didn't take the necessary precautions to protect himself or others. And the longer Donald Trump is president, the more reckless he gets. How can we trust him to protect this country? All right, we don't really know because we don't know when Trump last tested negative, but he's likely still shedding the virus, according to experts who will now speak later today from the White House. Uh, Trump will now speak later today from the White House balcony after being told that he couldn't return to the campaign trail until Monday. But he is planning a rally in Central Florida on Monday. We still don't know exactly when he contracted the COVID-19 virus or when the last time he was actually tested, though he participated in a made-for-TV interview last night with a doctor on Fox News, a doctor whose questionable credentials include having downplayed the coronavirus pandemic, predicting it would be no worse than the flu. Trump told the Fox News TV doctor that he has been tested and is getting results back sometime today. But he was short on specifics, similar to a tale he told Fox's Sean Hannity when he was pressed on the subject of his testing status on Thursday night. Have you been tested sure, recently? Uh, and, yeah, I just saw the doctors today. They think I'm in great shape. I'm in great shape. Did I you know test negative? In that. And I'll tell you, I took this uh, Regeneron. It's phenomenal. Have you had a test since your diagnosis a week ago? Well, what we're doing is probably the test will be tomorrow, the actual test, because there's no reason to test all the time. There's no reason to test all the time. There's actually a reason to test to see whether you've got the antibodies, to see whether you've got coronavirus. You don't need to test all the time. You're the president of the United States. So now the quite likely contagious commander-in-chief is going to be hosting public events again at the White House, where the whole thing likely got started. The original scene of the crime, the infamous Rose Garden event for Amy Coney Barrett that featured a who's who of Republican power players, folks without masks, gathering in close proximity, chatting, hugging, later heading indoors for yet more of the same. Here's how the event was described by Trump's own infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Well, I think the, the, the data speaks for themselves. We had a super spreader event in the White House, and it was in a situation where people were crowded together and were not wearing masks. So uh, the data speak for themselves. That's not just Fauci speaking truth to power. Here's Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on the state of affairs at the White House. I haven't been in the White House since August the 6th. And I personally didn't feel that they were approaching the protection from this illness in the same way that I thought was appropriate for the Senate. 
just to underscore, that was the Republican Senate Majority Leader, who never uh, has any space between him and Trump, saying that he won't go to the White House because of how irresponsible the president has been about COVID precautions. But as usual, Trump is looking in the most inappropriate places for someone else to blame, alluding that the White House spread might have been caused by a September 27th Gold Star family event, where he says the families of fallen military members got up close and personal with him. Newsweek reporting the claim did not sit well with veterans who labeled Trump's suggestion as disgusting. Alan Pitts, an Iraq combat vet and Purple Heart recipient, saying, as if Gold Star families don't have enough tragedy and guilt in their lives, their commander-in-chief is adding to their burden. But it's just the latest incident of Trump abdicating his responsibilities and shifting the blame to others. It is extremely sad and embarrassing, end quote. According to event organizers, family members were tested at the event and found to be negative for coronavirus and all have felt fine since. Finally, in a reverse of direction from Trump's ramblings earlier in the week, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin is offering up a new $1.8 trillion proposal for a new round of coronavirus economic relief. Uh, he's doing that with Nancy, Spe Nancy Pelosi. So the negotiations continue despite the president insisting earlier in the week that there would be no deal until after the election. Joining me now, Democratic Representative Debbie Dingell of Michigan. She's a senior whip for Democrats in the House. She's either the co-chair or vice chair of about 16 caucuses and members of many more. She's also been the target of the president's personal attacks in the past. Uh, Congressman Dingell, uh, good to see you. I'm, uh, I'm excited. I'm coming to your state in just a few hours. Uh, but I, I want to start with what's going on in your state. You are someone who's been at the receiving end, uh, quite recently actually, of Donald Trump's wrath. Uh, this is a serious matter that I think Americans expect the President of the United States should be taking more seriously than he seems to be. The, the targeting, potential abduction and murder of a governor. You know, Ali, um, I was not surprised when the story broke on Thursday, unfortunately, and that should uh, bother people too, because I have been the target, the subject, as you say, and the result uh, what happens when the hate and the vitriolicness that follows those kinds of attacks. Uh, I do wish the president would be uh, or more uh, careful in his words. I don't think that he understands how his words have tremendous consequence of impacting people. But I also am going to tell you, I think all of us need to take a deep breath. And how is he able to continually do this? And people aren't outraged and it's politically acceptable. and. He keeps doing it because there hasn't been enough negative response to him so that he understands that this is hurting him. It's hurting all of us. I am, uh, I, I, I respect, to, you saw my governor, she is out there. She is a strong and determined. She's not gonna let this impact her. I, I have tried very hard to do the same, uh, becoming the target of him in some public ways. But I want everybody to open their heart and really think about what's happening in this country and that you are letting your heart harden. And nobody can let that happen. We all need to take some responsibility for what's happening in this country. Congresswoman, in about six hours, I'm going to be talking to voters in uh, in Dearborn, and I'm going to want to uh, hear from them how they feel about this. But when you look at the last 10 days for the president, uh, his his remarkably bad debate performance uh, did hurt him in the polls more than it has hurt any modern president. Uh, his, his COVID handling uh, only underscored that two-thirds of Americans think he would do a, he's doing a worse job of handling uh, coronavirus than, than Joe Biden would. And then there's this, because he did tell the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by at his debate, which sounded not just like a dog whistle, but a, a, a clarion call for, uh, for right-wing militias. And now this has actually happened. Don't you think, I mean, what do you expect will happen? Do you believe that Americans will say, now we've crossed from the sublime into the ridiculous and dangerous? So if you had asked me two weeks ago, I, I was concerned. I was getting some of the same feelings that I had about 216. The debate performance which you just talked about the last week. I mean, I'm, I'm normally someone who tries to be civil and I, it was just, I was incapable of not holding the president accountable and just ranting about him this week because his responsible. So his behavior is so irresponsible and people trust him, they're his leader. And when he went up, first of all, that drive where he put everybody at risk, but when he ripped that mask off, he's killing thousands of people because they follow him, they don't wear their masks. They're not doing what they need to do 
and 210, 211,000, the number grows every day. Americans have died. I think people are listening to this, but I think people like you and I and others have to be very careful because I was down river last night and uh, got an earful from a lot of people who think we're beaten up on the president and there are more people that need to be taking responsibility. And there are still strong Trump voters out there and the same ones I warned you and many others about four years ago. And while I think the majority of American people want our country to get rid of this drama, they want to get back to normal. We got to be very careful to make sure that we are all taking responsibility for what's going to happen on this election. And I'm going to tell you, it's 25 days to the, this uh, election. And I, somebody who knows, the only thing I know about 2020 is that the unpredictable is what's predicted. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Congressman Debbie Dingell, good to see you. I uh, look forward to being in your state in a few hours. Debbie Dingell. You'll be in my hometown in a few hours. Note within 20... I absolutely will be. I, I look forward to it. I always enjoy coming to Michigan. As you know, as a Canadian, it's uh, it's it's kind of like going home. But at least I'll be able to see home from there. Good to see you. I'll see you later. Uh, with 24 days until the election, I'll be in Detroit tomorrow for Velshi Across America. I'll speak with a group of voters about their priorities next month and with top lawmakers in the state, including Senator Gary Peters, Lieutenant Governor Car Garland Gilchrist, and State Attorney General Dana Nessel. Tomorrow, starting at 8 a.m. Eastern, this afternoon, I will be spending time with some Michigan voters. Meanwhile, with just 24 days to go until Election Day, most surveys show Trump losing big to Joe Biden. The NBC News average of recent polls shows the Democratic nominee at 52% and Trump down double digits, 41.4%. With Election Day fast approaching, new reports say Trump is apparently losing his you-know-what behind the scenes at the White House. The New York Times writes that the president is lashing out at members of his own cabinet as he grasps at straws, looking to implicate his political rivals in wrongdoing. Joining me now, Rena Shah. Shah, she is the founder of Republican Women for Biden. She's also on the leadership team of Lincoln Project's Lincoln Women's Coalition. Rena, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Um, yeah. What do you make? Uh, I, I think it's interesting what, what Debbie Eagle just said to me, in that we have to be careful. We have to take necessary responsibility. Um, necessary responsibility involves voting. Uh, but what what do you make of what has happened? I, I'm kind of concerned. Is, is President Trump uh, acting out because he's on dexamethasone, a, a, a serious steroid, or is he cornered and desperate? I genuinely believe the president is incapacitated. And I'm not a medical professional, but anybody with a working brain can see that this is abnormal. The way in which he's acting is completely unhinged. We know that the White House, as the Lincoln Project said, is in total collapse. We can prove it. There's evidence of this. I mean, the president is not acting like a normal, rational human being. A normal, rational human being would not have walked into a debate hall knowing that they potentially had COVID-19. And, and in the days that have followed, the way he left the hospital for a joyride to wave to supporters, the way he's come home early, I don't believe that's going to play well with folks. And so I fully believe if you look at this on its face, you see a president that's incapable of controlling himself and incapable of controlling the country, and he will be voted out and escorted out of the White House in January. But we cannot be complacent, so we have to do our part. Rena, you and others in the Lincoln Project and Republican uh, Women for Biden, you are Republicans. You are you are conservatives, and and I think in in a, a perfect world, uh, things would be normal, and there'd be a normal Democratic Party and a normal Republican Party, and and a voter might actually be able to watch two candidates and say, "Hi, I kind of like this one, or I might like this one." You you tweeted the other day. My whole life, I've been told to look at the president in times of crisis. Now our president is the crisis. What is your argument to remaining Republican voters? Um, not not the sort of 25 percent who who are never going to peel off of Donald Trump, but somewhere between the 25 percent and the, the 35 to 40 percent who want lower taxes and smaller government and stuff, you know, Republican principles. What's your argument to them about you're going to get them better if you get rid of this guy and then become a real Republican Party again? The first thing I say is look at the facts. We already have an electorate that is not engaged. And those of us that do care and do vote and have in the past, well, we look at this whole thing and we say, what is another four years going to be like? Especially young mothers like me. I have a two and a four-year-old. There is no end in sight. 
that every day is a challenge balancing work and young children and any children that have to do virtual learning, that cannot see their friends, that cannot understand why our new normal doesn't mean they can go to a play place or birthday parties anymore. What I say to those Republican voters, especially women that I've been having phone conversations with over many months now, and even gone back and seen in my home state of West Virginia, I sit with them and I hear them. And I say to you, tell me, what does he mean to you? What does this president mean to you? Because to me, I think conservatism could have survived four years of Hillary Clinton. What I see right now is illogical. It doesn't make sense because we teach our children not to call names, to not do the things, the very things that this president does. And so how do we get more Americans to the table when this is the person at the top who's alienating so many? And what I hear from them over and over is that the Democrats are the boogeyman. The Democrats will tax us to death. They will make us liberal like California and look how that's worked out. And I say to them, you don't know what this president is doing. And I present them with facts. And that's why I'm so proud to be part of the Lincoln Project, Lincoln Women Coalition, because we have rolled out so many ads just this past week. We dropped seven just three days ago. And my favorite one just day before yesterday called Regeneron. These are visual depictions of exactly the fact we need to present these voters with as to what is problematic about this president. Why? It's just not us being a lot. Look, I'm a lifelong conservative. I'm not an alarmist. But I show them some of these ads and, and they say, yeah, you know, you make a good point, but I'm worried about Biden. I don't think he has the best interest for our country because he's a professional politician. So they like what they're getting from Trump. They like this sort of unusual, different brand. But what they don't realize is it's put the lives of many black and brown people like myself and my children in danger when we go into the streets and we know we, can, we cannot guarantee our safety. We cannot. These are the words of a Republican. Rena Shaw, thank you, my friend. Good to see you again. Rena is the founder of Republican Women for Biden. She's on the leadership team of Lincoln Project's Lincoln Women Coalition. I think it's important for you to understand Lincoln Project and, and groups like this, they are Republicans. Uh, they may have left the party in some cases, but they are conservatives and they believe in a Republican party and conservative values and would like to have this as a discussion, a real discussion, not, not a maniac uh, versus someone else running for president. Thanks, Rena. Coming up next, Mike Pence's refusal to answer a critical question at this week's debate. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, your silence was loud and clear, but I want to leave you with another response to President Trump saying, don't let COVID-19 dominate your life. Meg Brissett from Boston emailed us at mystory at velshi.com. She got COVID back in March. She writes in part, as a lifelong asthmatic with other health issues, I have lost lung function and stamina. I'm struggling with exhaustion and so many other debilitating complications that I have no choice except to let this dominate my life. We want to hear from you. Email me your coronavirus experiences at mystory at velshi.com.